All right, let's see, can we get started? All right, hey, y'all, for real, we got to pray. <laughs> now, I'm try look, we, I think we might be already be online, so I'm trying to govern myself accordingly. All right, we're praying, we're praying. Terry Sims, Terry Sims, all y'all in the back. Get police that section back there for me, please. We finna pray. All right, we are praying. We are praying. God, once again, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the wonderful service that we've had thus far. Now we ask that you will bless us as we study your word. Give us insight as to what you're trying to teach us in today's lesson. Help us to take it to, and apply it to our lives and help us to share with others as we study your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our facilitators today, we have a, a group of wonderful ladies that will be facilitating our lesson study today. Uh, Sister Brenda Cowan is the head facilitator, but she has some help. Amen. So we're going to have a wonderful study. How many of you have been enjoying the book of John so far? Amen. So we're going to have a wonderful study this quarter. Let's say amen as our facilitator. You know, the Brenda Cowan is coming along with others. Let's say amen. Have you been blessed already? Have you been blessed already? That was really, really good. Seriously. The Lord blesses us every Sabbath, but that was really a special blessing from Mary Tate today. I really appreciated that. So, in the words of Carl Jones, we won't be here long. He says that and then... But anyway, um, before we get started, I'd like to let you know that today, as you said, I'm the head facilitator. Um, I'm going to start us off with the introduction, and then Terrica Sims is going to come along and take you through Sunday and Monday, and then Willie, Willie Broomfield is going to take you through Tuesday and Wednesday, and then I'll come back and close. So um, we're going to come to you in our own way the way that the Lord has led us, and so we're thankful for that opportunity. Um, I know that they want you to participate, so when you're asked questions or um, ask for suggestions or comments, please give them. All right, I'm so fired up, and I don't know where I'm going to start, but here we go. We're gonna, um, this week's lesson is called Signs of Divinity. And I want to start with a, with a saying from Sister White from um, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1113. Because we're talking about the signs of God's, Jesus' divinity. So let's see what she has to say about his divinity. We, I'm sorry, was the human nature of the Son of Mary changed into the divine nature of the Son of God? No. The two natures were mystic, mysteriously, sorry, mysteriously blended in one person, the man Christ Jesus. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Deity did not sink and die. That would have been impossible. Christ, the sinless one, will save every son and daughter of Adam who accepts the salvation proffered them. Consenting to become the children of God, the Savior has purchased the fallen race with his own blood. This is a great mystery, a mystery that will not be fully completed, un completely understood in all its greatness until the translation of the redeemed shall take place. Then the power and greatness and efficacy of the gift of God to man will be understood. But the enemy is determined that this gift shall be so mystified that it will become as nothing. Signs of divinity. So as those of you who have studied know that this, this week we went over three um, miracles of Jesus. 
The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the eternal son, one with the father, underived and uncreated. Our memory verse is uh, John 11, 25 and 26, and we'll go over that again in Thursday's lesson, but we'll read it now. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I think as we go through this and listen to the other miracles and things that we'll, we've studied, um, we should ask ourselves, do we believe that? And, and as you've said already, we do. Jesus, was always, Jesus has always existed. There was never a time when he didn't exist. Though Jesus came to this world and took upon himself our humanity, he always kept his divinity. And at, a, and, at, and at specific times, Jesus said and did things that revealed this divinity. The truth was important for John, which is why when recounting some of Jesus' miracles, John used them to point to Christ's divinity. Jesus not only said things that revealed his divinity, but backed up his words with works that manifested his divinity. This week's lesson looks at three of the greatest signs of Jesus' divinity. Which is strike, which, what is striking is that in every case, some people did not believe the miracle or perceive its significance. For some, it was a time of turning away from Jesus. For others, a time for deepening blindness. And for others, a time to plot Jesus' death. And for others, a time to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. As I've already said from the beginning of this gospel, of his gospel, John wants to make one thing clear. Jesus is God. Could you bring the microphone to Deborah James, please? From the beginning of his gospel, John wants to make one thing clear. Jesus is God, John 1.1. 1, 1. It does not limit itself to narrating the evidence or signs of that divinity, such as the resurrection of Lazarus, but rather complements them with the words of Jesus himself, such as the sermon that followed the feeding of the 5,000, or with the words of his followers, as in the case of the man born blind. Who is Jesus? What did he say about himself? Okay. So as we went through the lesson this week, we went over three of the seven I am statements. Thanks. And Deborah is continuing to read. <laughs> so the first one is, and just read them please. I am the bread of life, the prophet who was to come, John 6, 1 through 15. The bread that came down from heaven, John 6, 16 through 36. I am the light of the world, an enlightened life, John 9, 1 through 16. Choosing darkness, John 9, 17 through 34. I am the resurrection and the life, the resurrection of Lazarus, John 11, 1 through 44. Thank you. So we're going to consider the three miracles that's mentioned up there that stand as definite proof of Christ's divinity. These miracles certainly provide added evidence that Jesus was more than a mere man. Hello everybody. So <laughs> Sunday is about the feeding of the 5,000. So to lay out the facts, the feeding of the 5,000 was near Passover. Passover 
is the Jewish tradition of a sacrificial lamb that was slain to save the, the Israelites from Egypt while they were still in Egypt, if you catch my drift. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb in our place. That's right. I call it the life for a life. On the cross, the punishment that we deserved because of our sins fell on Jesus instead. Christ, our Passover, was, sl was indeed slain for us, and that's in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. He bore the guilt of transgression and the hiding of his father's face until his heart was broken and his life crushed out. All this sacrifice was made that sinners might be redeemed, and that's from Ellen G. White as well. Could we put up John 6, 1 through 14? And I do want to pose the question that the Sabbath school, that the, um, the Sabbath school book asks, what parallels can we find between Jesus and Moses? And anybody is welcome to answer that question. We do have a runner. One, both of them was a deliverer. Okay. Now, I don't want to turn into Tammy Clark Sims, Masters of Education, but I will. We will stay here until somebody answers me. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Moses went up to uh, Mount Sinai, and then Jesus uh, went up okay. in the mountain also. Anybody else? Hmm. I want to confess something, but I'm saying it in a way. Uh, Jesus was a, a person that gave uh, the instructions given from God to us, and Moses was the same way God talked to G Moses and told him what to tell us. So they both got similarities that way. Um, God gave um, the Israelites um, manna to eat. And then Jesus went to uh, and gave um, maybe five rolls and, mm -hmm. and two fish. Okay, thanks. Twelve, which, which represented the disciples. I mean the uh, yeah, disciples. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. So, for my answer, I was just thinking the people. No matter if we were talking about the Israelites with Moses or the people that Jesus encountered during his time on earth. People were complaining in both situations. There were people who were devout. There were people who were trusting and there were people who were doubting. One thing remains the same, people will be people, but <laughs> Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, the will will be done in Jesus' name. So I did wanna ask the question for I do apologize, everybody. It's not in, it's not in there. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so the question, I'll, we'll just skip that question. It was on the slides, but it's, it's fine. Okay, so numerous details about this story place Jesus in parallel to Moses in the Exodus. The time of Passover in John 6, 4 points to the great deliverance from Egypt. Jesus goes up to the mountain. As Moses goes up to Sinai, Jesus tests Philip as the Israelites were tested in the wilderness. The multiplication of the loaves is the reminiscent of manna. The gathering of the leftover food harks back to the Israelites gathering of the manna. The 12 baskets of leftovers that were picked up is the same number of 12 tribes of Israel. And the people that commented on Jesus as the prophet coming into the world parallel to the prophet like Moses. All of these points back to Jesus as the new Moses to come to deliver his people. So John is showing Jesus 
not only doing signs and wonders, but in their context should have been a special meaning for the Jewish people. Jesus was pointing them, in essence, to his own divinity. So when we read Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, and 1 Peter 2, 24, what great truths do these texts teach about Jesus as the Lamb of God? And how does his divinity tie to the truth? And why is this truth the most important truth we can ever know? And anybody, yeah. In reading that, those passages of scripture, uh, it can be summed up by saying, he let them crucify him to pay for our sins, that we may die to our sins. And when you think about that, that's powerful. And he, when we make it personal, it's even more powerful. He did it just for me, just for me. Okay, I can go ahead and give my answer. So life as we know it is sin-based. We are nothing but filthy rags, but his blood washes us clean. In his blood, life as we know it turns it on its head. Him taking on the excruciating weight of sin and still loving us at the same time means the world. I know it means the world to me, and I hope it does to you as well. So we're gonna move on to Monday. And this is, surely he is the prophet. So when we read John 4, we read John 6, excuse me, 14, 15, 26 through 36, how did the people respond to his miracle and how did Jesus use this to try to teach them about who he was? They either believed it was a miracle mm -hmm. or they didn't believe it and they, they left. And it was one more about the Catholic dogma. Would anybody else like to answer? Some did believe, some didn't believe. And at one time or another, Jesus has appointed, especially the, the religious leaders of that particular day, he used scriptures of the Old Testament, which identified the scriptures identified as him as being the son of God, especially in the book of Isaiah. But they couldn't comprehend the light because of the darkness. And Jesus also told them, <clears throat> excuse me, he told them, labor not for meat which perishes, but meat which endures. He told them that even though uh, they was fed in them, in the wilderness with manna, but it was God that was giving it to them. So that's something that we got to always keep in mind. It's the Lord that's taking care of us. Even though we may have the means to prepare things and get things for ourselves, but the ultimate is God is preparing it for us, not us. Also, I want to, um, I don't see it up on the screen, but Moses, you know, he, he performed miracles as well. He, he split the sea open and people walked over on the water. And then Jesus performed multiple miracles and people still turned their wicked ways and didn't believe. So I think that's a good comparison right there that both of them both performed miracles mm -hmm. and people forgot about the miracles and still did their horrible things. Okay, so when we do look at John 6, 14 through 15, we see that, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intended to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by, by himself alone. And then Jesus later on answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God has set his seal. So like humans, they want to, we want to exploit any and everything. They were trying to make Jesus their king to provide for them, which in a way, you can think that that would be a good thing, but that's not his will. And I still want to say the miracle of Jesus disappearing into thin air shows more than we can imagine about him. He just disappeared into thin air and none, no one knew where he went. And I kind of find it funny because it's just, Jesus just disappeared into thin air, like who else could do that? Like, that's, it's just mind boggling to me. 
So the, the Judeans were expecting an earthly Messiah who would deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And I just want to add this preface before I say this. My, I don't mean to start up this controversial topic of conversation. I just want to say my piece. Currently, my earthly flesh wants Jesus to save us from the results of this current election. <laughs> it's so obvious who should win, but each side feels that way because our belief systems and our morals differ. <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> the people in the back. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna say it again. It's so obvious who should win? But because each side believes that, it, that's why it, we're neck and neck with each other. But because I can't fathom <laughs> what others think and truly how they feel, I look to my father to make the decision and ultimately save us from impending oppression and destruction. D despite the election and what's going on, the main thing we got to, got to realize is that uh, it's all up to, up to God, mm -hmm. you know. Amen. Um, so trust in Him, right. and you can't you can't fail. Right. Amen. I feel the same way you feel about the election. <laughs> now we know who should win. <laughs> <sighs> but that's not why Jesus had come, I and know. it <laughs> wasn't the purpose <laughs> of His miracle. Instead, the account of feeding the 5,000 provided the opportunity to illustrate that Jesus is the bread of life, that God himself came down from heaven, where he said, I am the, good, the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. But the people missed all of this. Their dissatisfied, heart, their dissatisfied hearts excuse me, here queried why. If Jesus could perform so many wondrous works, as they had witnessed, could he not give them health, strength, and riches to all the people, free them from their oppressors, and exalt their power, his, his power, exalt to give them power, excuse me, and honor? They were looking for material benefit instead of truth that endures to eternal life. This is a trap, and we all potentially face it if we're not careful. So how can we avoid getting caught up in material things at the expense of the spiritual? I got kind of distracted when I was studying a lesson. Mm -hmm. I kind of went to James the Little, some kind of way, and it talked about how the whole time the disciples walked with Jesus, he was uh, crippled, he was paralyzed. And he kind of mentioned it to one of the other disciples that, you know, Jesus see me sick uh, and see me crippled, why don't he heal me? Uh, well, you know, some, and I thought about it, I said, you know, why did he ask Jesus to heal him? Or why did Jesus see the need for him to stay like he was? Mm -hmm. And your, to your question, some things happen because of Jesus' plan. Right. You know, you would think that the man should not say anything at all because Jesus reads our mind. He knows the man wanted to be healed. He knew that. Mm -hmm. But the man said he healed everybody around him. He was the Messiah. Right. He healed everybody to come and say, heal me, but I'm walking with him. It's something to think about. For three years, I'm walking with a limp. I'm walking with a, with a stick. We walk in miles and miles and miles, and I'm still crippled. You know, and Jesus never said, him, heal him while he's walking with me. It never happened. So some things happen because Jesus got a plan, and sometimes he got a plan for you because you do get uh, high mighty when you uh, get different blessings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have to stay in the situation they are in order for them to realize how good God is. It's kind of deep what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because if he healed everybody or he gave everybody the blessings or everybody looked at him, it, it, it would be a whole different outcome. Another thing I'm, I'm, I'm curious about when it comes to Jesus, all the miracles he wrote, we didn't see it. Oh, yeah. They saw it. Mm -hmm. Why did they believe it? It's just so mind-boggling that all the things he did, why didn't everybody follow him? But they didn't. And that's so sad. But think about it like this. 
You know how you can be looking for your keys, they'll be right there in front of you and you won't see them? I feel like that's the same thing. Could be. One comment, uh, how do we keep from getting caught up in the material things? You can look at the devastation that these two recent hurricanes right. has caused. If you look at all of those people, they've lost their houses, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their places to work. Material things are not going to save you when things like the storms hit. And if you are focused on material things, what are you going to do after a devastating hurricane tears up your house, your cars, the stores, your jobs? You've got to have an anchor that'll keep you in spite of losing every material possession that you have. And if we don't learn that now, see, there's some difficult days ahead of us. If you've been reading the news, not just in the newspapers, but the news as uh, the great controversy, and Ellen White has pointed out, uh, there's going to be a time when every earthly support that you have will be cut off. And if you can't depend on material things then, you got to know that you have an anchor. We've got to know three things. We've got to know who Jesus is. We've got to know what his power is. And we've got to know the scriptures. Amen. Wonderful comment, Elder. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about, even as he was speaking about the things that are currently going on in our world, we as believers, must never forget that this world is not our home. That's right, we're strangers, we're pilgrims. So if we have this embedded in our hearts, when those things happen, we won't be troubled. We won't, you know, we won't lose our faith. But we'll be able to stand by God's grace because we, our home is in heaven with Jesus. And then class and church, when the Lord was using Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt, they had no earthly support. They had to take God's word, what he's speaking through Moses, and believe it. Whatever he said, shout. he manifested it and showed them, I'm going to take care of you. A pillar of fire, cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, protection. He told them, you won't have any sicknesses and illness of the diseases of the Egyptians. Right. He protected their health. He supplied every need that they had. He supplied it, but they had to trust him. Right. Also, sister, I mean, I just want to shout. <laughs> we got to wear this word, my mama used to say, like a loose garment. Mm. In other words, we can slip it off and slip it back on whenever need be. We can't get caught up in these houses, these cars, all these material things. Material right. things. Those folk lost stuff in a split second. Right. Some of these homes were million dollar homes. None of that can save them. We got to use these things while we're here, but we can't get too caught up with them like my brother said. We got to walk in this world like strangers. Because this ain't our home. Yes. We're looking for a better place. That's right. Walk the streets of gold. And when we think about that, and, and no more sickness, yes. no more dying, no more hurricanes, no more, no more. Yes. Praise God. It reminds me a lot of, um, what did Donald Lawrence say? Um, we're, we're, uh, we're not a natural being having a spiritual experience. We're a spiritual being having a natural experience. So I have to, we have, I have to remind myself of that. And also, my favorite scripture is Psalms 121, 1 and 2. I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. And it's, but I usually lean on that usually when, when life gets hard. But I try to remember even in the good times because I always want to keep my eyes on God. And especially, like, I, my answer to the question was, especially in the last few weeks that we've lived, the weather exemplifies the revelation days that we are now living. So we have to remember that this is not our eternal home. He is soon to come. Let's try to take as many Amen. people with us as we can. Hey, everybody. I'm going to ask my grandbaby to come.
come and um, do these slides for me. I'm really not that savvy with that, so. But we're gonna get to the um, two. I'm sorry. Because I know I, I really need to put this mic to me because when I'm looking at this on TV, I'm just like, I can't hear hardly anything you guys are saying because it's like, I'm texting Denzel, Denzel, I can't hear anything. He texts back, Mama, they don't have the mic to their, to their mouth. So, yeah, thank you guys for reminding me of that. Okay, the first one says, two so says, The Healing of the Blind Man, part one. And when Brenda asked me to uh, do this lesson, I agreed to do it, but... I just want Brenda to know that I'm a cook and I'm a social worker. I don't normally do things like this, so, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go ahead on and do it. Now, if you ask me something about cooking or what I need to do that, call, call me. Ask me something about social work or social services, I'm on it. But I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead on and do this, okay? So, this says, read John 9, 1 through 6. What did the disciple think was the cause of this man's blindness, and how did Jesus correct their false belief? I'm going to put down, I'm going to read what I put down, then I'm, I'm going to get some comments from you guys. I said, the disciple asked, who seen this man or, or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus responded, neither, but that it was the work of God should be made manifest in him. They wanted to know, you know, who seen Lord? And we know it may not be in a, things that happen to us in our life, it may not be a direct sin of something we did at that point, but we know all, all our problems originated from the sin in the garden. So it did eventually just trickle down. So can anybody wants to kind of elaborate just a little bit on this? What did Jesus' disciples, what did the disciples think was the cause of this man, this man blindness? And how did Jesus correct it? I know I read it, but somebody else may help us a different version of it. The thought of that particular day, the way that the religious leaders had taught them all these years and years and years and years, is soaked into their mind when a person is blind, when a person is sick, when a person is this, is something their parent or them has done, they have seen, don't it would have never happened to them. That's the way they thought in that particular day because that's the way they was taught. And Jesus had to let them know that's not true. Job didn't do anything. Right, right, right. The disciple made a connection between sickness and sin. A number of Old Testament passages point in that direction. But the story of Job sh should have led them, should have led to caution about whether such a connection always occurred. In fact, and we do that today. We do that today. If, if somebody has cancer, if it's lung cancer, we may ask, you know, this is a result from your smoking. Not that it can be secondhand smoke or just because of sin in the world, we're going to have something. But we do it today also. Right. We, uh, thank you, Jack. And we do it. We have to be, be very, very um, cautious about saying things like that. Because Joe was sorely afflicted, afflicted and his friends sought to make him acknowledge that his suffering was the result of sin and caused him to feel under condemnation. They represented his case as that of a great sinner, but the Lord rebuked them for, for them. The Lord rebuked them for this judgment of his faithful servant. Because you know, we all know the story, well, most of us know the story of Job. You know, the Lord asked uh, Satan, have you seen Job? Have you considered my servant Job? So when a lot of times, like Jackie said, we think about, you know, the sickness or even though it may not cause, you know, maybe a correlation of it, we have to realize Job, he was a just man. And the Lord told him, have you considered my son, Job? Y'all, that's powerful words. You know, how often do the uh, Lord say that about us? Have you considered my, my servant, Faith? Have you considered my servant, Charlene? Have you considered my servant, Roger? I dare you try to test him to see what's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's a Psalms that David said that it was good that I was afflicted. Sometimes sickness brings people to a sense of their need of God, um, the sin sometimes that is in their life. And, and so even in, in that, sometimes it serves a purpose, right? That's right, that's right. Hey, Faith. Who called me? No, I was just going to say, you know, the, the traditions that they, uh, they had grown up with as far as the scribes and the priests and all, as far as, associating uh, sickness with, with uh, some sin, 
But then just think about a, a child and the birth in the womb of a mother. I mean, what kind of sin did they commit, you know? But I mean, they were thinking, hey, either you sin or your parents sin. But a child can't sin if they're in the womb. So, I mean, it's just the, the blindness that they had, you know, on them as far as just teaching all this kind of foolishness. Do we have any other comments? I'm going to read the, um, the, um, the, the narrative does not tell the, the reader until John 9, 14, that Jesus did the healing on the Sabbath, which according to, to, to tradition and not scripture violated the Sabbath. And thus he was counted as a Sabbath breaker by the Pharisee. Their conclusion was that he was not from God because they maintained that he does not keep the Sabbath. But others found this troubling that a sinner could do such, such signs. So the psalm was saying that he was not uh, of God because he broke the Sabbath. And then others were saying, well, even though he may have broken the Sabbath, he couldn't have done this unless it was of God. And we have to be careful cause of, about doing things on the Sabbath and saying when we break the Sabbath. I just tell people all the time, be led by the Lord. Because there are some things that you may do on the Sabbath that I may not do and vice versa. But I always say, be led by the Holy Spirit. Some people may say, I remember, I think it was Tad was saying that he was low on gas one time and he just went to the man and say, you know, sir, I'm low on gas, I'm a Sabbath keeper. You know, can I come back after the Sabbath and pay you for the gas? And the man gave it to him. And I don't know if I would have done it, if I would have just gone to say, you know, well, I'm just gonna purchase this gas and cause the Lord know my heart, I need to get to Sabbath school, I need to get work. I got to tell my children, you have to know the Lord for yourself. You have to, you know, your relationship with the God, with the Lord might lead you one place and it might lead me somewhere totally different. Miss Harold. Yeah, I He's gonna bring you the mic. I was gonna ask the question, did the Lord break the Sabbath? Did he break the Sabbath? Did, did he break the Sabbath? No. Okay, why didn't he break the Sabbath? Because it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And that's it. It's lawful to do and, good and, on the Sabbath, and he also is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, so now my point is this. We need to be careful, like you said, Faye. We got to be careful because you got to know the Lord for yourself. Don't judge anybody if you see them coming out the grocery store right. on the Sabbath. You don't know whether they are going to get something for somebody that's sick and can't go. So that's my point. Don't judge people because you don't know. You just don't know. Yeah, yeah that's, that's absolutely, you're absolutely right. Because for me now, when I was raising my children now, we didn't, we didn't go out and eat on the Sabbath. But then I might go home and cook up a feast for the whole city. So, you know, is it the same difference? I don't know. So I didn't go, we didn't go like, we couldn't go out, we just did not go out to eat on the Sabbath. But I would go home and if I didn't finish my dinner that Thursday night or that Friday, I would go home and do a feast. So is this the same difference? I, the, the, the judge not, that we be not judge, I think God said that because he knew that we would always look at what people do from our own lens, right? And so, our understanding of keeping the Sabbath is based on how we were raised. Right. And we shouldn't um, assign, I'm very guilty of this, assign that same value to somebody else who was not raised the same way, right. right? Culture, race, all of these things, practices, geography, all of that informs people's understanding and belief and practice in the Sabbath. So like you said, it's, it's really dependent upon the Lord, your relationship with God. Um, and we should focus on just keeping the Sabbath ourselves because most of us can't e even do that. Right. <laughs> like we don't even have the energy to be looking at what somebody else is doing. Right. Okay. The last question says, what should this story tell us about the danger of being so blinded by our belief or tradition that we, miss the, we, we can miss important truth right before our own eyes? And, you know, we all know tradition are just simply custom that have been passed down from generation to generation. And while customs and traditions are good, it's okay to follow tradition as long as they are in align with God's word. Does anybody have a comment on that? Yeah, Faith, you know, the, the Pharisees and all, when the, the blind man was healed, and whereas that, they said that Christ had broke the Sabbath, and whereas that, which, which we know he did not do any wrong, but at the same time, 
the reason they were saying that is because he could have healed a man uh, any other day than the Sabbath. They said the only time that, uh, I guess, healing is supposed to be done on the Sabbath if it's an emergency. You know, so this guy's been born, we blind ever since birth. So it wasn't an emergency. So, I mean, they didn't look at the marvelous thing that had been done as far as a blind man from birth, his eyes being open. They just looked at the Sabbath being broken. And then it brought up division among the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Right, 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 right. Because, you know, I mean, they said, well, he broke the Sabbath. But then they said, hey, how, no, no man, even the blind man said, no man has never done a work like this. Open up blind man's eyes from birth. You know, so, I mean, it was just, just crazy with the tradition that they had. They were so blind by Satan that they couldn't see the marvelous work. I mean, even the blind man said, this is a marvelous thing. It has been done. Okay. And then, Sister Faye in class, excuse me, uh, the religious Roger. leaders at that particular day, they also put pressure on a blind man's parents. And they had to tell them, our son is of age. You know, you can go talk to him for yourself. And the blind man talked to the religious leaders. And one of the things that religious leaders did, they put so much pressure on him at that particular time, they put him out of church. They put him in Christ out of church. They cast him out of church mm -hmm. for no particular reason. You know, this uh, issue of uh, how to keep the Sabbath is a, an important issue, and we have got to have a clear understanding of it because that the Sabbath whether or not you obey the Sabbath or not is going to be one of the big tests that's going to come upon us. And if we are out, let's say, playing ball or shopping and, and going about doing a lot of things, when the church, the Catholic Church, takes over the government of the United States and the United States passed that, what they call National Sunday Law, then you've got to know the correct, because they're going to bring up all these things that they say, well, you know, you Seventh-day Adventists, uh, you, you go to the malls, you shop, you play ball, you watch all kinds of things. So how are you going to call Saturday the, the Sabbath and, and you resting? And you've been doing all this other stuff. And you, it's going to come back to you when you have to make a that decision whether or not to, you're going to worship on Sunday as the, they call the Sabbath, the, uh, on, on the Saturday, which we call the Sabbath. To answer the question, it was saying that um, how do we not be so blind about our own beliefs and traditions that we miss the important truths right in front of our own eyes? I just think about how we can be so blinded by what we normally do by our normal routine that we won't hear or feel the impression of the Holy Spirit and that in, in and of itself is sin because you're not being obedient to what God is telling you to do. Just because it's something that you've always done even though in your eyes it's good, if God is telling you go left and you go right because that's your normal route, that is still a sin at the end of the day. The Pharisees and scribes were, were in it for themselves. They made up laws that benefited them, and that's why, why Christ said that, um, what he said about, uh, you, you said that you see, so your sin remains, because they, they um, were not, not um, for God or, or it, at all. Thank you. And also, guys, in keeping the Sabbath and doing anything that we have, the Lord has asked us to do, the only way we're going to realize, we're going to muster this is we're going, we have to study the Holy Scripture to become acquainted with the Holy Scripture. These past, probably past three, four quarters, since I have just been delving into Sabbath school lesson, I can see a change in my life. I can see some things that I probably would have done nine months, ten months ago that I won't do now, simply because... I'm studying the scripture and I'm knowing these things, and the Lord's gonna bring this to my attention. It's like, you're not gonna be able to do this thing we should be able to do as we continue to study His Word, as we listen to the uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll, 
I, it has, they have done an excellent job, and I know I'm veering off a little bit. But those elder ladies, elder, they have done a tremendous job in bringing that, bringing that home for me. But, but I'm just saying, when we listen to these things and studying the word, that's going to be a change in our life. Now, the change in your life may not reflect mine's. It may be different. So like they said, we can't pass any judgment. Amen. OK. And, and real quick, to piggyback on something that Elder Yates said, when the Sunday Blue Law passes, it's going to be too late. The decisions that we're making now is sealing that. So we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, when you become converted, strengthen your brother. Thank you, Lord. He said, when? He didn't say if. He said, when? He said, the work that I have begun in you, I will complete it. He said, when you search for me with your whole heart, you're going to find me. And we're having prayer services uh, in the morning with the prayer group. And I said, Lord, I know better. Am I searching for you with all my whole heart? Or am I searching for you with part of my heart? Because he's, the, word, the word is true. So if he said, when you search for me with all your heart, you're going to find me, I'm going to find him. We have to be emptied of ourselves, filled with the Holy Spirit, get rid of this pride, everything else, take our eyes off of other people, look to Jesus who is our example. We look to other people and say what they do. As they said earlier, judge not that you be not judged because for what, what you use to measure the judge is what you're going to be judged by. So we have to realize that the decisions, seek out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. This is, this is not our home. This is a serious event. The Lord is having mercy on us. Thank you, Lord. When a hurricane was, was a four and a five, he, he told Satan, it's going to be a hurricane, but it's not going to be as strong. He cut the winds down. Thank you, Lord, for his grace and mercy. He's showing us things so that we can empty ourselves and have the Holy Spirit fill us so that the decisions we make now is, is sealing. What are we going to do then? Flo, did you have something to Flo, you had your hand. Did you have something to say? Or you gonna read? You gonna read what I asked you to read at the end? Okay. All right. Yeah, I was. I was just gonna say there is a danger in a belief that once saved, always saved. Right. And a lot of and a lot of times we do uh, find ourselves believing one traditional way of things, and that and we embedded it in our hearts. And when once it's embedded in it to our hearts, as, as Jesus Christ was trying to show them difference in the tradition and the true belief, they was, their hearts were still hardened. So one of the dangers is not to harden our heart against things that we know that is not true or see. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Charlotte. I had a, a nurse manager. She was a, not, not, a, not of my color. She's been raised a Seventh-day Adventist. And I had, I've been there like 20 years. And is another nurse came on after me. And this nurse worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever day it was, she worked all the time. And I think she got a little bit upset with me because, and you're talking about judging, I chose not to work on the Sabbath. Although, you know, as a nurse, you can say I'm doing good. I know my weakness is like anybody else. TV on, conversation. You know, I feel like if I'm going to work on the Sabbath, that money should go to God. Everybody don't feel that way, but I do. Because I feel like if I work on the Sabbath and you paying me money, I'm getting paid. So I chose not to work on the Sabbath. And when I tell you I got judged because they felt like I was being legalistic or I was being uh, all kinds of stuff. She started telling me, well, you know, your, your other nurse, nurse that goes to uh, New Covenant, she's working all the time on the Sabbath, and she's come to have some of our functions on the Sabbath. And so I have to say this, you have to ask God to really give you not to follow traditions of men. Just cause some folk do it, they have as they do it, don't mean you have to do it either. But you got to be led by the Holy Spirit, and everybody going to think different about every situation that comes up when it comes to how you eat, how you sleep. Everybody in the church is going to think differently. But you got to be led by the Spirit right. and everything right. you do. You can't be doing it because you want to do it, but you got to be do doing it because you're led by God. And I think even when Jesus healing on the Sabbath, he is Lord of the Sabbath. He did it for a reason. And it's not for me to judge, not for me to make light of it, not for me to make too much of it. He did it, and it was done. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap up Wednesday lesson right quick because basically we have pretty much gotten into uh, the healing of the blind man part two, so we're just going to wrap it up a little bit. The first question said, what question did the leader ask and how did the blind man respond? They were simply asking him, you have been blind since birth, you know, how were you healed? And he tried to give them an answer. But of course, when he gave them an the answer, they still was asking them questions. And he pretty much said, I've said this already. Why are you constantly asking me the same thing? So basically, that's what was happening in uh, the healing of the blind man part two. So in the essence of time, we're going to read the bottom question, which said, read Corinthians 1, first, read first Corinthians 1, 26 1, to 29. How does Paul write in these verses fit with John's account above and how the same principle can even apply now? And um, Ms. Um, Jones is going to read us the answer to that. When he was writing about the foolish things, that's what okay. he asked. Christ chose the foolish things of the world, those whom the world pro proclaimed unlearned and ignorant, to confound the wise men of the world. The disciples were unlearned in the traditions of the rabbi, but with Christ as their example and teacher, they were gaining the education of the highest order, for they had before them a divine example. Christ was presenting to them truths of the highest character. Those whom God employs to do service for him, he would have fitted in his way for that service. Those who preach Christ must learn of Christ daily in order to understand the mystery of saving and serving the souls of whom he has died. They must pattern after him in all things sharing his tender compassion and his sternness against all evil working. Christ was stern in some things. Okay, okay that concludes our lesson for uh, Wednesday, and I thank you guys for participating. I, had, I know I had asked some other members to read something for us. I really thank you for agreeing, but in the end of time, um, Sister Calvin gonna, I don't know if you're gonna do it or we're gonna end it. We're gonna end it or you're gonna, excuse me? Is she gonna end it? You know we can't give you. You know we can't give Paul no mic out. <laughs> I'm gonna be nice because we're still on air, but <laughs> as as soon as we go off, <laughs> let's give all of these lovely ladies a hearty amen. <clears throat> amen. Our Women's Day service has been great thus far. Amen. And we want to thank you all for staying. We, this looks pretty good today. Amen. I think you all stayed because we had food, but that's another story. <laughs> but thank you all for staying. Of course, everybody knows about the Fun Fest tomorrow, so I'm not going to belabor that. Looking forward to seeing everybody there come out and have a good time. It's going to be great. But uh, thank you again for staying and sharing. Again, uh, for those of you who are online, um, for those of you who are online, uh, you're welcome to come to the Fun Fest as well. But additionally, uh, we will pick it back up around about an hour or so <laughs> again uh, on Sabbath School Overtime, and we'll discuss some additional matters. Uh, this, this was really, really great study. Great study, great study, great study. So I think this quarter is going to be really, really good. We still do, uh, last, one last thing. We, if you haven't picked up your Sabbath school materials, we still have some additional materials that need to be picked up. So if you need your materials or if you want to share some with others, we still have a few books left. I'm going to ask uh, Elder Turner, I'm going to ask you to take the microphone to my good friend, Dr. Forjure, back there to have closing prayer. Let's stand. Thank you, everybody. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for loving us so much that you have planned for us to get to know you better through your word. May what we have studied today become part of our 
of our lives. Help us to have an obedient attitude, an obedient mind. Help us to have a made-up mind to always follow you. Bless us for the remaining hours of this Sabbath. And then, Lord, what we study here, help us to be able to share it with others. And when we come back next, next time, bless us to be able to come with a, with a testimony. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.